Okay, now I'm going to try to explain how we get to Constantine. Where I'd stopped was with the Severan mothers. Paul, using the term to cover them, which I covered extensively in the uh, Vimeo channel called Paul Meter GGS 11. Link to that will be in the video description. It is especially referenced in Ephesians 1 9. And it's referenced for the very years that the Severan Mothers came back into power. Hence, I know, even without seeing the meter yet, I know that John is referring to that. Because Paul is the guy who coined the term mystery as a moniker, nickname, for church. Church Universal. All the believers who believe in Christ from, you know, Pentecost until the rapture are called church. Even if they call themselves Jewish or Baha'i or atheist or Muslim or whatever they call themselves, if you believed in Christ, you're a Christian. Whether you know it or not, doesn't matter. And therefore, you are part of church. Mystery is a nickname for church because it was hidden and it remains hidden. Nobody really knows who a Christian is. Alright? It's hidden. Nobody really knows what the Christian doctrines are until they get become a believer and they use 1 John 1 9 and learn them. So, being a Christian is a mystery. All these people running around saying, Oh, you have to evidence salvation or you're not a Christian. That's a particular uh, lie that's being told by the Calvinists like R.C. Sproul. What a jerk these people are. You can't evidence your salvation by good deeds. If that were so, then anybody who's Muslim doing good deeds or an atheist doing good deeds or a Baha'i person doing good deeds, that doesn't mean you're a Christian because you do good deeds. Good deeds are what people do for a lot of different reasons. And most of them are not good reasons. Okay? A lot of good deeds are done so that you get approval from other humans. That's not evidence of anything but your ego. So it doesn't prove that you're saved because you do good deeds, all right? And you know that's people are getting that by by misusing and not reading the Greek of James two, okay? So I have to leave that out because I've already covered that in the James videos, which you can get in YouTube or Vimeo. The point I'm trying to make here is that this is the nickname for church that Paul coined, and pretty much everybody in Christendom who's a teacher knows that, or should. It was very common knowledge when I was growing up, and so it should be common knowledge now. So mystery, and then the, tying it to the mothers, the Severan mothers, okay? So, and then harlot, we've already explained, we've already explained abomination. Now, blood of the saints, drunk with the blood of the saints, our first reference, like I said, is to the Severan mothers. As a result of the Severan Mothers being in Rome from in, in their reinstitution, you know, getting back in power from 218 to 235 AD, there ensued a great deal of resentment against them by the other nobles and other, pa you know, patricians of Rome. They didn't like the women being there. They didn't like the women running things. And you can find out a little bit more about that if you read either Barely on Septimia Severus or you read Barbara Levick's book on Julia Domna. You, but you, there are a lot of sources where you can find that out. Just look up those names. There ensued between about 219 AD, 217 AD, um, a great deal of persecution of Christians, not by you know, the, the, the leaders of Rome, but by the mobs, okay, by the patricians instigating the mobs. And they were doing that because the Christians themselves, and this is where we're going to get into Constantine, the Christians themselves were, were eating each other. There was a guy named, there were two guys named Hippolytus, and they were fighting. There was a guy named Callistus, and he was fighting. And the the patrician Romans got so tired of it and the crowds got so tired of it plus on top of that a bunch of Christian crowds were busy saying oh the millennium is gonna come Christ is gonna come back Christ is gonna come back 
He's in, you know, he's going to be here any day now. And they were all yelling and eating each other and fighting with each other over this. Hippolyte is finally writing, no, it's really 5,500 years since Christ was, you know, since, since the earth was founded and Christ was, came, and we got 500 years left to go. Where he got that number, I don't know, because it has nothing whatsoever to do with the Bible. And you can search on that in Google, too. Hippolytus, H-I-P-P-O-L-Y-T-U-S, and then 5,500. Don't put a comma. And you'll find the reference to it. There are a lot of references to it because it's another commonly known thing. So they were eating each other in Rome over who was more holy and who was more sanctified and who was more, and this is where the term is invented, Catholic, katharos in Greek, pure. That's what it means. That's where the term Catholic first becomes used. It is also the first time in history where Peter is put on a bishop's list. And that you can find um, in a book called Bishop's Lists by Stephen Lee Williams. Or Robert Lee Williams. I forget which of those two. I, I reviewed the book in Vimeo. And the, the um, videos are also in YouTube. Okay. But the book you can get at Amazon or you can get from Georgia's Press. Um... It's called Bishop's List, and he traces the origin, not to make the pun on origin, the guy. He traces the origin of the rise of Catholicism the way we know it today. It did not exist until Constantine. But this is the precursor of it. The Christians politicized. Okay? They politicized and they ate each other, starting about the second century. Okay? And by this time, which is considered the third century, early third century, in Rome they were fighting in the in the two two tens, and at the same time, Origen, the guy O R I G E N, was trying to convert the Severan mothers and their kids, who are the emperors, to Christianity, and that's one reason why the patriarchs, um, you know, the patricians rather of Rome were more incensed at Christians than normal because they were worried that the Severan mothers who were already building themselves out to be priestesses would take up Christianity because they were already using religion as their card. See? Woman and the beast that carries her. What's the beast? Religion. See, you have it identified already here. See, scarlet, that was the color of the priest's the high priest close, Pontifex Maximus. And beast is, you know, the whole religious institution. You're riding on religion to have power. You're riding on religion to get political power. You're using religion, the religious card, to get political power. Does that sound familiar today? What are all those so-called Christians doing? What was the Tea Party? What is stinking Jerry Falwell, whose father started the movement? They did. In the 1960s, Jerry Falwell Sr. decided, oh, God's not good enough. We have to politic. And he invented the lie. Well, he wasn't the only guy. David Duke really was pro doing this. They invented a lie that abortion is murder. It's not. The Bible never says it's murder. The Bible says you're not even human until you're born. Go look up at the sequence of Genesis 2-7. But when you want to ride the religion into political power, you'll make up whatever you want. And that's what Jerry Falwell Sr. did in the 1960s. I didn't even know about that. My pastor did, however, and he taught stridently about what was wrong about the whole pro-life movement, starting in the 1960s. Okay? And he spent a lot of time explaining that you're not human until you're born, Genesis 2-7 being an example, and abortion is not murder, and I've done videos on that in my Pro-Life Blasphemy series. There's actually about 500 verses on this topic, so it's not like it's small. All the Jews know that they, the word golem means fetus, and it's the Jewish nickname for, for Frankenstein. You know, animated flesh, but no soul. 
Yeah, because your soul is imputed to you at birth. That's what Genesis 2-7 says. And it's imputed and created directly by God. So you are directly created by God at birth. That's why you're not evolved. Your body is just a house. That's Psalm 139 in the Hebrew. So in other words, Jerry Falwell and his jerk-off compatriots in the 1960s decided to throw out the Bible. They wanted to become kings of the earth. So they created a scarlet beast and wrote it in the power. That's how come Trump got elected. Seriously. That's why the GOP is, is, is behind him. I, you know, I, it's just totally shocking. And it started in the 1960s. And I've already done started the videos on that in Matthew 24, starting at the 42nd video in the series. And this is like the 90-something video in this series. I'm still going to keep on doing it because I want you to see that that statement about Trump is sourced in the prophecy that goes back to a, a trend of history depicted here in Revelation 17. It's going to happen literally in the tribulation also. But it's a, tribulation, it's a trend of history the meanwhile because Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. So he's trying to create this scarlet beast that the kings of the earth to commit acts of immorality with using church to do it. Because that's what he needs to do to get ready. You see the point? And persecution of Christians by Christians. <coughs> which started under the Severan Mothers in the, in the mid-200s. Well, actually, 215. And the riot that occurred, the riots that occurred amongst Christians in Rome, and the concern of the patricians in Rome over them getting all that, you know, evangelization by origin, led to a pogrom in a, between 215 to 20, somewhere in there, of Christians and the guy I told you before named Callistus who's calling him he's the first guy that we know of that who used the word Catharas for Catholic that he was the most Catholic that his his congregation was the most Catholic of all the all the Christians he was the purest okay and that's why they were all fighting with each other and that's what made Rome the other patricians they said, you know what, we can't, we can't live with these people anymore. So they got rid of the severance in 235. Before 235 AD, they got rid of the Christians. And Callistus himself was killed sometime around 2, 220 AD. In order to stop the Christians from, from eating each other, the pagans started eating them. Alright? So drunk with the blood of the saints starts out with that historical connotation which Matthew 24 covers and Luke 21 covers and Ephesians 1 covers and Mark 13 covers. As you're going to see with Mark 13, I haven't shown you that yet, but I'm going to. Okay, that's the precedence for Constantine as far as this, you know, intrafratricidal Christians eating Christians and pagans eating Christians. So drunk with the blood of the saints. Alright. And blood of the witnesses of Jesus. Okay. So not every saint is a witness. In other words, you can be a believer and be saved. You're called a saint. Saint just means sanctified. You know, uh, what is it? He Hebrews um, 10, 5, well not verse 5 itself, but 10, 14. Sanctified for all time. Saint is the noun form of sanctified. Alright? So you're a saint. Just call yourself saint and put your name after it. Okay? But you can be saved and therefore a saint, but not a witness. Because you don't say anything. Because you're not skilled enough or learned enough scripture. Alright? So, having done all this, it's kind of, you know, there's a, a whole lot here. That he wouldn't even need to go through that far in the future. But John is writing this out. And then John himself is saying autobiographically. When I saw her. The vision of the harlot sitting on the 
religious beast, okay, with with a seven at least seven nations sort of joined together to ride the religion and the power, okay. He's saying, when I saw her, I wondered greatly. It's not really wonder. It means he was shocked. Here we go. When I saw her. Right here. See this? Damado. It's used a lot. It doesn't just mean wonder. It means shock, okay? It's got a whole like range of, of emotion. It's an emotional reaction, and this is there. You can you can look it up in there. You can just search on this online. Dalmazzo. You can type it out with um, Roman letters. T H A U M A Z O. Okay, this is an omega, so it looks like a W. All right. It means to be shocked. And then these are the Hebrew words that I like there a lot. Okay, amazed, but it, but it it's a Hebraism for um, yeah. But that that's the, that's when you're trying to be the nice. It's got you're shocked and happy, or you're shocked and upset. See, Bauer Danker shows you the range to be extraordinarily impressed or disturbed that's the semantic range of the word like when in Matthew 2 this large contingent of Persian um, what do you want to call it they called themselves Magi but that the, they were astrologers really okay they come running into Jerusalem saying where is this Messiah who's just been born? We saw his star. It wasn't a physical star they saw. And you know why you know that? Because Jerusalem didn't know about it. If there was some real star up in the sky depicting the actual birthplace of Messiah, then Jerusalem wouldn't have been thalmazot. That's the word that's used. They wouldn't have been disturbed by what the Magi said. They would have known already and said, oh yeah, I'm fine, you just go over to where the, the star is. The star would have then been in Bethlehem, which it really wasn't. There was no star of Bethlehem. Period. I've done videos on that, so I'm going to move on. Tamazo means to be disturbing. Okay? John was therefore shocked. I mean... Go back. All right. Wonder is not a good word. Wonder is like to take out the 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 strength of the verb. This is what I hate about translations: is they always water it down. I was shocked. I was greatly shocked. And so the angel says, "What? What? What? Why are you shocked? In other words, how come you don't know already?" Well, obviously, the thing that's bothering John is that when he sees the vision, he realizes, oh, yeah, this is a, this is a the play on Ephesians 1.9. He didn't know about the seven mothers, or maybe he did. But he, he just knew that it was something in the future that had to do with the unity of church and state, which was always forbidden, even in Mosaic law. Moses was not a priest remember his brother was okay so I was shocked so the angel says well, well, why are you shocked huh what because it's church what church can't become corrupt like Israel did guess again so I'll tell you the church see he's, he's mentioning mystery because he knows that that's what's shocking John I will tell you the mystery of the woman see bride of Christ and the beast religion that carries her into politics, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Okay? Now, it can be any seven heads, because it's the Roman model. And it can be any ten horns. They don't have to be in the same geographical area as ancient Rome was. Okay? This is, this is where the theolo theologians get all screwed up. They're not thinking. 
Rome never, ever, ever in her lifetime, in the whole lifetime of the Roman Empire, whichever one you want to call the Roman Empire, and there have been like seven or eight of them who tried to call themselves that, they've never had seven heads and ten horns. Everybody's always guessing, well, let's see, if the revived Roman Empire occurred today, it's got to be over the European area, and we've got, well, ten. Yeah, and the European, modern Europe today is more than ten countries. Guess again. Okay? They're thinking they have to be ten contiguous countries in order to be the revived Roman Empire. Uh, hello? Rome, ancient, never was like that. It was never ten. Not Western Rome, not Eastern Rome, okay? It was never ten or just seven. So it's not talking about, you know, matching the geographic contiguity, all right? Just forget, you know, there have been thousands of thousands of hours and millions of dollars spent, people trying to guess, well, which ten countries is it going to be? Which seven heads of state is it going to be? Please, people, read the text. Think about the history of Rome. It doesn't fit any period of Rome. And it's not supposed to. Because here's how you know. Look, the beast that you saw was... and is not. Okay, well then it doesn't mean the geographical, the geographical, the geographical, the geographical uh, con uh, configuration of Rome because Rome still existed in 88 AD. Domitian was emperor then. And is not. Okay, so forget about trying to say. Forget about trying to say that, um, you know, this is the revived Roman Empire in the same geographical configuration as it used to be, because he's saying is not. At the time Domitian was in power, okay, Rome's extent was really pretty far, because just before him, yeah, just before Domitian, that's the mission, isn't it? 88? Yeah. Before him was was Vespasian and Titus. Titus died in 81. That's when the mission started. Okay. Rome was at its, you know, it wasn't at its complete peak yet. But it was, it was pretty far along. Alright. The, the eastern border of Rome was somewhere midway between... Uh, most of Anatolia was part of Rome, or under its, you know, uh, tribute, tributary to it. Um, that's not ten countries. So, it is not. But was? Was? Prior to Domitian? Was? Well, that can't be Rome then. Do you get that? Whatever beast that was is not now. Well, when, what was it? And then it says, and is about to come up out of the abyss. Okay, the abyss is mentioned in Revelation 9. So whatever it was, it's going to be like it again when it comes out at mid-tribulation when Satan gets the keys and he opens it up for Abaddon and company to come out. They're all demons. The 200 million there is a demon army. Why people think that it's the Chinese, I don't know because it says very clearly that they're coming up from underneath the earth. They're demons. My pastor, when he covered that, said, oh, three demon armies. You can get my, you know, rbtheme.org. You can get the Revelation series and hear it yourself. It'll take you four years. Because he taught it every day for four years. Went through every single word in Revelation. Okay? So, what is it that was that is so much like the abyss 
that's yet future and is not now. Well, think about it. What happened with the abyss? Why are so many demons in there? Well, what happened in Genesis 6? All the demon boys decided, oh, let's take on human form and fornicate with the women and make half-demon half babies. Because if you're an angel, you can do that. I mean, hello, the story's already told in Genesis 6. Okay? So there you go. Now, there's some debate about whether Abyss and Tartarus are the same place. But they've been there for a long time. So was refers to something they did before they got put in there. Alright? So the beast is what they used. And if we're talking about Genesis 6, what they did was they created an orgiastic religion. In, in ancient times, your way of celebrating a god... Or worshiping a god was to have sex with anybody and everybody during their orgies and of course that that still continued you know even later on the so-called bacchic b-a-c-c-h-i-c you know orgies of the greeks but it wasn't just the greeks that did this they had all kinds of n nonsense like that and there was a particular version called baal or chemosh where you were supposed to give up one of your own kids, put it in the arms of Molech, that's another similar name, and they have these statues of these dog-faced gods. And you put the kid in the arms of this statue, and they set the kid alive on fire. And then you were supposed to have sex while the kid screamed to show your devotion to the god and your sacrifice. These are the same guys who are going to come up out of the abyss. Alright? And that's exactly the way religion used to be. The beast is the religion. It was. And people are going to be amazed, those that dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder. See, same word, thalmazo when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come in other words there's going to be a revival of an orgiastic style religion that will have in it church now in the ancient world they had orgiastic religion they also had something else they had asceticism the cult of Sibylle, for example. They wanted to distinguish themselves from the other orgiastic religions. So what the, the, their males did was they, they literally um, castrated themselves to show their sacrifice to the mother, uh, earth mother. Okay? So you're going to have asceticism. Now, does it mean physical orgies? in this future time that's like what it was before doesn't have to be because what did he say what does harlot always mean the reason it's called harlot is partly because of this because ancient religion was orgiastic but harlot hi you're going after politics instead of god the god who said my kingdom is not of this world and you're going after this world anyway and you're going after politics anyway are you not having sex? The worst kind? Because it's in your head. Alright? So was. The idea is to, to drool over something in this world instead of God. That's just as, that's an orgy. The people around Donald Trump are orgiastic. Totally orgiastic. If you go to rightwatch.org, they collect statements and write articles about people like Pat Robertson and all the other droolers over Trump. They're orgiastic right now. You want to know what kind of orgy this is? Just go, go to rightwatch.org and Twitter 
um, you can subscribe to them when they make posts about you know their articles and just read it just listen to them drool over Trump oh he's the savior he's the this he's the that they're positively orgiastic that they're in power all the product of the now Jerry Falwell Jr. All right, so there you there you go. They fostered physical orgies in the ancient world, but which is worse? I mean, I, I hate to get crude about it, but I'm going to have to. If you're having sex with your wife and she's thinking about someone else, and somehow you figure that out or you find that out, how are you going to feel about it? Or you're having sex with your husband and he's thinking of somebody else, not you. He's pretending you're that other person that he really wants to have sex with. And he's sort of closing his eyes and pretending it's that other girl. How are you going to feel? Alright, that is what this is. The religion is a substitute for God. It's in God's name. That's how all these stinking, disgusting Seven Mountains people that are drooling over Trump now are doing. They're replacing God with, with their own version of religion. And they're drooling orgiastically over him. So, is not, means in 88 AD, that was not the religion of Rome. Okay, if anything, particularly not at the time that the angel is talking, because Domitian was something of a martinet. Okay, he did have a mistress, and he really liked her, his mistress, and he was a big fan of Minerva, one of the gods, Huntress. But he, he was like, I, he was a martinet. He wasn't having sex with everybody in sight. He wasn't orgiastic, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, Rome itself. Okay, they, they eschewed that sort of thing. It was not Roman. They tolerated it, but they made fun of it. Alright, they weren't orgiastic. That was a Greek thing. Alright, it was not a Roman thing. Okay, it's not that they didn't have orgies, but if you went to an orgy, you were, people would look down on you. Okay. When they wanted to make fun of somebody or, or call somebody a bad person, they would always say, oh, this person's having all this sex. So there was a certain asceticism that was prized. You know, the Vestal Virgins. Alright. So orgiastic religion was not. See, and is not. It was not part of Roman religion at the time. It was tolerated, but it was looked down on. You know, only common people did that sort of thing. Or only low-class people did that sort of thing. That's, uh, whenever, you know, I mean, you want to read Suetonius. You know, when they want to condemn somebody who was a Caesar, they always make a point about how much sex that person had. You know, Caligula, Nero. They didn't say that about the mission. Whenever they wanted to put somebody down, they'd say, oh, this person had all this sex. So, and is not. See where that's coming from? Sorry, I was losing my footing. I'm standing up to talk. Okay, so when it comes up out of the abyss, those are those same demons who are involved in an orgiastic religion in the ancient world, particularly Genesis 6. Okay. And they got jailed for it. All right. And they're going to come, they get to come out because Satan lets them out. That's Revelation 9. That's mid tribulation. Tribute, trib midpoint. Actually, it's the beginning of the third year. For five months, they do the torture thing. And then the, that, the, the sixth month, there's a sort of a transition. And somewhere during the sixth month, they kill the two witnesses. That's Revelation 11, which has already happened. Then we're in the last half of the tribulation, and we're actually at the end of the tribulation, and the angel's explaining the big nuclear explosion that happens. Okay? And go to destruction. You know, meaning that when tribulation is over, they're going to get jailed for the thousand years. Okay, now watch. So those who wonder, whose name has not been written, 
they're gonna they're gonna be shocked they're gonna be impressed when they see the religion rise but we know that that religion is mystery so the religion that rises is gonna call itself Christian maybe it's Chris Lam okay cuz Islam is all big on on sex maybe it's Islam maybe it's Chris Lam maybe it's some um, other sort of conglomeration of various religions in the world but it's gonna call itself Christian not necessarily solely Christian but it's gonna call itself Christian because uh, that's why this word mystery is here if the word mystery wasn't here you could say something else I call it in all my writings fake church and it's a trend of history right now seven mountains so now I'm, I'm I'm taking a long way to get to Constantine, but I, I need to sort of give you the provenance of all this. Okay, so they're all wandering after the beast. Now here we go. Here's a mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. This is your quintessential verse. Sorry, it's in blue. Let me see if I can make it. This is our proof about Constantine. Let's see if I got viewing. There's something that allows me to color it. I forget. Apply color to selected text. Yeah. Make it yellow. Oh, it didn't do it. I did it wrong. Let me try it again. Tools. Viewing the text. Apply color to select the text. Okay, so where did I get... Oh, well, maybe because I hit the wrong thing. Background. We'll make it bright yellow. Hope it'll, hopefully it'll... No, let's make it green. That's easier to see. Okay. Apply color. There we go. So I did it right. That way you can see it. Okay. This is our key that it's Constantine. It, that it's Rome. I already you mentioned. But it's like why Constantine in particular? Okay. Well, we know it's Rome because that's the name that the Romans called themselves. That's your first clue. We know it's church. For the reasons I just explained. But we know it's Constantine because, first of all, Matthew 24, Ephesians 1, Luke 21, and Mark 13 all focus on the rise of Constantine. Because that's when church starts. The, the beast, the church beast, see? Woman sitting on a scarlet beast. All right, do that color thing again. Oh, okay, here it is. Black color to see like the test, yes. See? Beast is religion. Rome didn't have it. Beast is not at the time. It was, yeah, because there used to be this kind of thing sponsored by the demons who are coming now back out of the abyss all right there's gonna be another one another beast another religious scarlet means religion and then mystery 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 right here see and Babylon's your other big clue because, you know, that's what Babylon was. Remember the big statue? Okay. So, it's fake church. Well, there wasn't any such church, fake or otherwise, in the Old Testament. That's why it was called, that's why Paul uses the term mystery, ha ha. It was hidden in God, disclosed now, alright. The woman, bride of Christ, fornicating, playing the harlot, see, harlot. Uh, 
okay? It, none of that stuff could have existed until post cross with the word mystery. Okay, Constantine was the first guy, Roman Emperor, Roman style, remember Seven Mountains means Rome. He was the first Roman Emperor who created a unity of Christians. Council of Nicaea, 325, and before that really it was 317. The whole Christian unity with Rome started under Constantine. Before that, the seven mothers were courted by Origen, but they didn't convert. Possibly Severus Alexander believed in Christ because those were his toys that he played with as a kid. But Rome didn't convert. The emperors didn't convert. Alright? Constantine's the first one. So this, you see? Here's my, the seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. There was no woman sitting on any seven mountains until Constantine. Period. And there are seven kings. This is, this, this is the part that gets everybody confused. They think seven. Oh, you mean seven prior Roman emperors? Five have fallen. One is. And the other night you come. Honeys. Honey, honey, honey. So why are they thinking specific? First of all, there were more than five or seven Roman emperors at the time this is written. So it can't be referring to prior Roman kings. It can't. And there were no Christian kings prior on which the woman sits. So it can't mean Rome and it can't mean Christian. So what is this? Well, if you went back to what John is quoting or alluding to or tagging, we're talking about the statue. You know, the man of time starting in Daniel 2, the vision with the head of gold and the chest of silver and the belly and thighs of bronze and the legs and feet of clay mixed with iron. That's four. Four. Gold, that was per uh, Babylon. Silver, that was Persia. Bronze, that was Greece, and Rome was the legs with a mix of, of you know, whatchamacallit. Okay, well, Rome is not fallen yet. See, one is. Rome still exists at the time of writing. So the five who have fallen, well, we've identified four, but one of them still is. So that leaves three that we've identified. So there are two others. And as we saw here, Babylon is the prototype for Rome. Babylon was the head of the Daniel II man of time. And then you get more detail that, that's, you know, about the seven and the ten in Daniel 7. Alright, so we know at least Babylon and Persia and Greece. Because they all have fallen at the time. I mean, Persia still exists, but it wasn't the Persia of the, you know, ancient times. I mean, you know, it, they, it called itself Persia, but it really wasn't anything like the Persia of the, of the prophecy. That Persia died, you know, with Alexander, just like the prophecy said it would. Alright, so what was calling itself the power of Persia then, just like the Rome of today, is not the Rome of this prophecy. Okay, you don't have an emperor in physical Rome. So then there are two other empires. Because Babylon was an empire. Persia was an empire, dead now. At the time you write, he's talking. 
okay Greece was an empire also dead taken over by Rome just like the prophecy said and Rome is the one that is so Babylon Persia and Greece are three of the five who have fallen so then the question is well what are the other two that have fallen and there's a lot of speculation about that you know before Babylon it was Assyria Babylon took I mean if you're gonna follow the same order as the man of time where one takes over the next takes over the next okay before Babylon it was Assyria okay and Assyria was was taken over by you know Bab uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dad or granddad something like that they got wiped out and before Assyria it's like well who's before Assyria alright and that could go all the way back to the the people who took over that made Abraham have to leave okay you know Abraham had to leave Ur of the Chaldees and as soon as he left I want to say it was the Gudians I don't really remember the name for sure but I want to say it was the Gudians who came over and took over that area that was northern like northern Mesopotamia you know way north way north I don't know and there's a lot of speculation about who were the prior to before Babylon that are being referenced here okay because there's been there have been several kinds of empires all right but the the one I know of before Assyria you maybe it's the Hittites kind of doubt that but it could be or it could be whoever took over that made Abraham have to leave I mean God told Abraham to leave just before they took over but you know they they have a name and I'm not sure what their name is it could have been them could have been Tower of Babel people I, you know Nimrod I, I don't you know I don't really know of course Shinar is a nickname for Babylon so maybe it was that I don't know it says five have fallen so there's two other empire empires besides Babylon Persia Greece one is that's Rome feet of clay and mixed with iron and here's the kicker the other has not yet come now here's your key first of all seven mountains Rome secondly Constantine was the first Roman Emperor to unite with the Christians and unite religion and state under himself so the woman Christianity is sitting on her religion and is headed by one is okay in other words it's taking all of Rome historical Rome the Rome the classical Rome that we're talking about and continuing it all the way through all right but it didn't become associated with church until Constantine so it's Constantine and after and you can look through history and see that that's exactly what has happened starting with Constantine it got united with Christianity and then the Western Empire then, then the, the real key here is that Constantine split and founded what we called Constantinople he called it New Rome right there at the Bosporus okay today it's called Istanbul he founded New Rome replete now catch this replete with a reconstruction of the same seven mountains that were around Rome Italy Rome he created new Rome replete with the seven mountains you can verify this anywhere you want my favorite pieces on this are o Oxford or Cambridge histories but those books are like $250 each you might be able to find them online I used to be able to read them in Google Books but he cre he created a second Rome he created a second Rome with the seven mountains and the Council of Nicaea was in Anatolia not in Italy and that's where the the prelates who are busy eating each other up all these past 
you know, 300 years, 200 years. That's where they thought, oh, we got our, we got our talents in him now. He, you know, we're united with Constantine. We're going to use the government. Yeah, and remember what it said up here about the blood of the saints? Once Constantine is in power and the church unites with him, you can go look it up at 4thCentury.com what the laws were under Constantine and his sons. And it was all about heretics and killing the saints and they fought over whether God was one or three. And they killed each other for the next several centuries over whether God was one or three. And then Rome split in 476 because it was taken over by the barbarians. And then the, this new Rome continued. We call it the Byzantine Empire. And they kept on doing this. Persecuting. They had one argument after the next. Monophysism, or whatever you call it. Uh, Nestorians. Or was is, is, is you know what does this mean? What, and we have some little doctrinal dispute over the meaning of it, and you don't agree with me, and I'm the emperor, so I'm going to kill you. The laws are just terrible, and you can look them up and read them yourself. You want to talk about blood of the saints? The greatest amount of blood of the saints that was spilled was not by the pagans, but by Constantine and his sons, and his, and all the people that came after them all calling themselves Roman Empire and after the Roman Empire split and the West died then there was the East and they kept on doing this same thing all of it everything you see here in green that's what it was in fact a lot of times it was a literal woman sitting on the beast usually her name was Irene Irene peace yeah peace wasn't what she was into she was busy drinking the blood of the Saints Okay, that's the, the, the future of the Byzantine Empire and Mark 13, which is why I'm doing this video, Mark 13 specializes in telling you the future of the Byzantine Empire. I did not know that until recently. And in order to understand Mark 13's benchmarks, I had to go listen to that Paul Friedman series of lectures on, you know, the first thousand years after Christ. Because that's what Mark covers, and I, I didn't I didn't know much about Byzantine history. And then I was able to find out, oh, I see why he's linking this year here. And each time he's linking it to a keyword about seeing something at the time when the person dies and is not seeing anything at all. And it's an emperor or an emperor's kid or, you know, see, blood of the saints, persecution. It's really biting. Seven mountains, New Rome, Byzantine. And the Byzantine Empire considered itself to be Roman Empire. Long after the West died. Okay, but in 800 AD, when Byzantium, the Eastern Empire that was calling itself the Roman Empire, when it started to decide, you know what, we don't really like this Pope thing too much. We don't even really like all these rituals and stuff like that too much. We're going to go for just the Bible. And that started, I'm not quite sure you could say it started under Leo III. Bible benchmarks it as, as being important with Leo III, starting in 723 in particular. But that was the height of it where it became an actual movement for a couple hundred years and as a result of that the Pope there actually was a Pope starting about three or four hundred AD probably maybe four hundred certainly not in three hundred because there were no popes as long as Constantine and his son were alive bishops of Rome but not popes um, They really didn't like the fact that Byzantium with seven mountains, New Rome, was, you know, kind of going back to the Bible. And so they had already taken up, because Pippin the Short had gone to the Bishop of Rome for advice about what to do about the dying Merovingian dynasty, and could he be crowned instead? And they said, yeah, well, we kind of need to 
be nice to you, Pep in the Short, who just won at the Battle of Tours in 733, I, a.k.a. Poitiers in 733. Uh, we need to be nice to you because, you know, well, we're not we're not really getting along so well with the Byzantines. Because they're going through this thing called iconoclasm, and, gee, they might not like us very much, so we need to find a new ally. So guess what? Pepin the Short's grandson, known to history as Charlemagne, Charlemagne, uh, I might badly pronounce French, um, Ch Charles the Great, Charlemagne, um, he comes to power in 768 on the death of his dad, and the Pope starts needing his help because they got the Lombards trying to take away their power. In Italy, the Lombards were really trying to, you know, hurt um, the Vatican. It wasn't really a Vatican yet. They were trying to hurt them. And so Charlemagne helped out. He protected the... Now they were popes. And so in order to, like, you know, assert control over Charlemagne and thumb their nose at the Byzantium, the Pope decides, oh, you know, their bishop, really, decides, oh, okay, I'm going to be nice to you, Charlemagne, and I'm going to be nice to you even more than to the Byzantines. And, oh, by the way, in 800 A.D., when Irene, here in Byzantium, is on the throne, two years before she dies, Charlemagne had already made an offer to marry her and unite both sides. The Pope decides, well, Bishop of Rome, decides, oh, well, you know, I don't really don't know if I want to do that because then they'll be united against me. So then he supposedly invites Charlemagne down for Christmas in 800. And Charlemagne says, oh, gee, you know, I, I, I was just coming to pray. And next thing I know, this crown is on my head and I'm Holy Roman Emperor now. See, in other words, to compete with the Byzantine claim that they're the Holy Roman Empire, the Bishop of Rome gets Charlemagne to be crowned. So, so no, we're the real Rome. No, we're the real Rome. No, we're the real Rome. And there you have the Christian cannibalism again. Blood of the saints. And it goes on. Sometimes the, the two the two empires start to get nice toward each other and decide, oh, well, let's marry our kids off to each other and then we'll unite that way. To hell with the beast. You know, because it says later on here that they, 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 hate, they hate the beast. They will wage war against the lamb. And they also hate the beast. Where is it? It, 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 if I, uh, it must be made for the beast. It was in the uh, eighth. And, you know, I'm going to talk about that later. They will wage war against the lamb, and they also hate, these will hate the harlot, see? They'll hate the harlot. They'll hate the believers. They'll hate religion. They're using religion for their political power, and the religion hates them, and they hate the religion. Well, that was already happening under Charlemagne and Byzantium, because all that got set in motion with Constantine because Constantine really didn't like the prelates. Okay, and they didn't really like him either, but they're all using each other to have political power. So that's why you know this started with Constantine. He's the guy who founded New Rome. And Byzantine Empire called itself Roman Empire. And then you have the West being invented by the Pope who crowned Charlemagne. So that we can have an alternate competing Roman Empire. And then both of them die. And then, and then, and then somebody else comes to power and says, okay, we're the Holy Roman Empire. And that actually lasts until the 19th century. And then he died in World War One. And then you have Hitler coming along and saying, oh, we're the new Roman Empire. So you see, this is a historical trend. And it can be any country. And Satan doesn't know when the rapture is going to happen. So he keeps on trying to find, well, let's see, what country is going to be a good candidate for, for being the Antichrist? Well, how about U.S.? Because a group calling itself Seven Mountains, could they be dumber? He's backing Donald Trump, so if 
forget worrying about Russia influencing the election, although that's treason. I'm not trying to belittle it, but it's Satan who's trying to influence it. How could so many Christians be duped by what is the most obviously bad man ever to run for political office? Everything that Christians allege to be for, he's against. Everything Christians allege to be against, he's for. I mean, if God was like flying, he made it. The guy's got 30 years information on him. He's been in the public eye. And for 30 years, he's been cheating people, lying, fornicating, doing every single thing the Christians are against. And he doesn't barely know how to spell Bible. And yet they're drooling over him. If that's not demon influence and Satan, you know trying to ready us for the tribulation because ooh it might happen now and then you know he's always saying that every year they thought Napoleon was going to be the Antichrist in the 1800s Satan's always trying to get this thing to go alright so seven mountains backing Trump the next Roman Empire next unity of church and state which is what the seven mountains people care about what the seven mountains people think is holy you can hear Raphael Cruz say that yourself in YouTube just Google on it Raphael Cruz Ted Cruz anointed or Raphael Cruz seven mountains or just seven mountains hear them in their own words not somebody who's against them like me hear them say it how do you think I learned all this? I've been doing research on this stuff here that I'm telling you for eight years because I learned it from Paul. I didn't know anything that there was a seven mountains set of false doctrines that a whole millions of Christians adhere to. I didn't know that existed until this election. I didn't even know Ted Cruz was my own senator until this election. And then when there were stuff being done about, well, should I vote for Cruz? I start looking that up in YouTube. And that's how I found out about this Seven Mountains thing. And I'm like, oh my God, these people are reversing Revelation 17. Not to mention the Constitution. Rafael Cruz totally reverses the meaning of the Constitution. So he and Ted Cruz, his son, wouldn't know the Constitution if it bit them. And that's why we have Donald Trump. Because the Seven Mountains people back Trump. So could this be more relevant to you? So you see now, it had its start under Constantine because there was no joining of church and Rome until Constantine. And then what this is telling you, they, they are Seven Mountains on which the woman sits present tense. And they are seven kings, meaning seven empires. Five have fallen. Three we know about. The two are up to speculation, whether it's the Hittites or the Assyrians or the, um, you know, the people under Abraham or whatever prior empire you want to name. The total of five. First two, I don't know who they are, for sure. But we know who the last three are. To really total of four, but that's one here. We know it's Babylon, see, named. And this is referring to Daniel too, because we know that from the seven kings and the ten horns. Okay, so that's Babylon, Persia, Greece, and they have all fallen. And then there's two more prior to them. One is, that's Rome, the fourth part of the beast, in the um, fourth part of the man of time. The beast, however, is religion. And why is it depicted as a beast? Because you're beastly if you're religious. It shouldn't be too hard to understand. A beast is like undiscerning. I, I don't know, think of a cow or an ox. Have you ever looked in the eyes of a cow or an ox? They're dead. The eyes are dead. And you have to really beat it hard. And it's, it's just, it's all about eating and, and, you know, it comes out the other end and having sex and just body 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 that's what's called beast 
brute beasts, as Peter puts it. That's religion. That's what it does to you. It turns you into a non-thinking person. You, you just might as well be a walking zombie or a beast. Alright? Only fit for slaughter. You see the point? Okay, so now five fall and one is. The other has not yet come. In other words, the, tr the actual tribulational future, you know, as it were, final emperor, is on the same pattern as Rome, and the same pattern as the prior empires, but doesn't yet, yet exist, because see, this is still the age, as it were, of Rome. And we're still in it. It's not over. Just don't know the identity of the future one yet. And it'll be on the same pattern as current as Rome was then. But you know, Rome as it was then doesn't exist now. Okay? Now, and when he comes he must remain a little while. That's you know the seven years. The beast which you which was and is not is himself an eighth and also one of the seventh and he goes to destruction. This is a little harder to explain. So I'll reserve that for the next increment. Because I'm my throat hurts.